Resilience was my companion. On my life's journey, that began on an ordinary Sunday in November of 1992. When I heard laughter and giggling coming from the living room of my parents' home, so I peeked out and I saw my dad and then three-year-old daughter eating gummy bears. My daughter would put one in his mouth and my dad would hold it between his teeth and gums. And the gummy bear would slip out and my daughter would giggle. It was funny to see my dad with a great big gummy bear smile. After a while, the joy had settled and it was time for our long four hour drive home. Hugs and kisses to mom and dad and my daughter buckled into her car seat. We were on our way. It wasn't before long she was fast asleep and I began thinking about the long list of things to do when we got home. My husband would be there waiting and another work week and family routine loomed ahead of us. As soon as we got home, the phone was already ringing. I came in, sat my daughter down on the couch and went over to answer it. Before I could say, hello, my sister was already talking. Kelly, you have got to get yourself back home. Dad's in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. He's had a seizure. He doesn't look good. My mind and body went into autopilot. I was so tired from the long four hour drive home. My heart began to race as I tore down the highway to the hospital. I arrived around midnight, not really paying attention on how or where I left my car. I walked into the emergency room. I saw my family gathered, but where's dad? It was all so surreal. I caught myself in a glass reflection, almost as an observer, but not really present. And then it hit me. This is really happening. My worst fears filled the room. And the oxygen was being sucked out by the sobs of my mom's cries. As the doctor came in, his disheveled look and weary demeanor betrayed his best attempts at delivering the news. There was no way he could soften what he was about to say. I remember the words so vividly as he sat next to my mother. Your husband is very sick. He has a rare form of cancer small cell carcinoma, which is spread through his body and into his brain. That's what caused his seizure tonight. Uh, doctor, I just saw my dad playing with his granddaughter this afternoon. Are you sure you have the right family? I'm very sorry. A social worker will be in to help you with arrangements. Arrangements? What arrangements? Did he just say my dad was going to die? A few days later, I was sitting next to my dad's bedside, holding his hand. And I was telling him, it's okay to let go, dad. As his let breast became labored, I was crying. It's okay, Dad. You did good. You raised us kids, right? I was 23 years old, and my hero just died before my eyes. Dad died the day after Veterans Day. As a family of patriots, we felt that was an appropriate homecoming for a Korean War hero. And it gave my daughter comfort, knowing that her granddad was going to heaven with a gummy bear smile. We would celebrate dad's homecoming every Veterans Day with a cookout at my sister's. Somebody would always ask for a war story my dad said, Korea, pff, that was nothing. You want a war story? Try raising three teenagers. There are some stories I can tell you. 
Thanksgiving had gone and passed, but Christmas, now that was mom and dad's favorite holiday. Dad would double wrap the Christmas gifts and he would get a great joy out of watching the kids tearing open their presents. And as they got to the next layer, my dad would point to my mom. She did it. It was a great big gas. We made as though dad was there and I think it gave mom some comfort too. Three months had passed, spring had sprung, and my heart and mind calmed a bit. It was a regular workday pace of answering the phones. I heard a soft voice. Kelly, mom's gone. What do you mean gone? Where did she go? It was completely silent. Kelly, mom's gone. Mom shot herself. Mom's dead. Did I hear her right? Did she just say my mother shot herself? That she's dead? The phone fell to the floor and I began begging my sister. No, please don't tell me that, no. How can a family be any more broken and devastated? My brother, sister, and I were barely hanging on and keeping things together. Everything was so out of order. We were all under 35 years old, and we had just buried both of our parents in less than three months. Well, life began again in its own strange and imperfect way. But something didn't feel right. Something wasn't right between my husband and me. His behavior was cold and distant. I was grieving. I needed his arms around me. He just wanted me to move on and get through it. I discovered I was living in a marriage of half-truths. I put on my blinders and I shielded my heart the best way I could. Raising a daughter without a father was not an option. And our families had been through more grief than anyone should ever have to bear. My self-esteem was at an all-time low. I gained weight. I put my feelings inside things that gave me comfort. I no longer recognized myself. I wasn't permitted any outside friendships. My life was work and home. So I made the best of it, and I began a home-based business caring for seniors. So I put my grief aside, and as time slowly went by, I realized this is my life now. <sighs> the grief I'd carried for my mom and dad was now buried deep in the heaviness of my soul and 263 pounds. Things seemed to move along and smooth out. I had a successful business. We built a beautiful new home, and our daughter had graduated university and was out of the nest. So I'd taken those blinders off I'd put on so many years ago, only to see that my trust had been betrayed yet again. Rage and anger filled my soul. It reignited the inner flame. I found my self-esteem under all those layers of denial, resentment, guilt, and fear. My 23-year marriage was over. I was devastated.
with my books, computer, photos, and a few sticks of furniture packed away in my car, I saw my memories dissolve as I drove down the driveway and the other woman drove in. I hit rock bottom. I began thinking about a statistic that a trusted advisor quoted to me, that children of a parent who has committed suicide is likely to die by suicide themselves. That's not me. I'm not gonna be a statistic. I've worked too hard and sacrificed too much to have my daughter find me dead in a gutter. Things seem so hopeless. How was I gonna get through this? Well, it turns out it was a walk in the park. Literally every night I walked in solace, thinking about the hard hits that life had given me and how I could use them like armor to protect myself from the hits that were coming next. The weight of my mind and body melted away with every walk becoming a self-awareness session, I built resilience, life's code of armor. Unlike a DNA code, we are not born with resilience. But like DNA that has four bases that send out messages for survival, resilience also has four bases that send out messages our messages, however, may be different. For me, mine are red, a positive self-image. I no longer see myself as my circumstances. I invest in relationships that invest in me. Yellow is a long-term perspective. My problems seem big, but I look at the bigger picture it's like the light at the end of the tunnel. Blue is a positive outlook. I can see the finish line, and I'm no longer going to be afraid at what might happen before I get there. And green is a courageous attitude. I step up, I put on my armor, I face my challenges, I manage them, and I set them aside for self-care. You see, sometimes we're called to be bigger than we are in life experience, age, or stature. Size doesn't matter in the times of tragedy and conflict. Resilience was my companion through my life's journey. It helped me through the loss and grief of the death of my parents it helped me find my self-esteem, forgive infidelity, and rebuild my home. I take those walks in the park still, clear my mind, and when I feel like I need resilience, I say these four phrases, and I invite you to say them along with me. I am valuable. I am worth knowing. I am worth fighting for. And I am worth loving. Now that's an idea worth spreading. Thank you.